Welcome to our 2021 Pricing Your Art Workshop. We're happy to do this virtually for the second year in the row in a row. And my name is Erin Ellie. I'm a manager with the Entrepreneurship Center and happy to be here. And we're, I'm here with Kristen Gapsky, our director. And we have Jill Jepson, Terry Abrams, and Valerie Mann, who we're excited to introduce. And thank you for being here. Wonderful faculty. And we're so so excited to hear from all of you. So we'll introduce you a little bit more um, as the program goes on. So I also wanted to thank our partner, um, Katie Williams from the Humanities, Social and Behavioral Science Division who helped us put to together this event. And so um, it's really exciting. We're really excited to be here and we have a lot of good information for you. So I won't take too much of your time, but I just wanted to start with a little housekeeping and let you know that this is being recorded. So if you don't wanna be on camera, please keep your camera off. And please keep mute on during the presentations. We are gonna have an opportunity to unmute at the end of the presentation. And we will be sharing a follow-up recording and we'll share a PDF of the presentation in a follow-up email. The recording does take a little bit of time to edit, um, but when it's ready, we will send it to you. And so with that, we will move forward. So this is a little bit of the agenda, what to expect today. Um, like I said, we're going to start with some introductions. And then for those of you who aren't familiar with the Entrepreneurship Center, Kristen will share some resources and some information that we have about the center. And then from there, you will hear from Valerie Mann. And then from there, Terry Abrams. And after that, Jill Jepson. And then after that, we'll do some breakout sessions. We'll have breakout rooms so you can have some fun conversation about pricing art. So with that, I will move forward to a fun little trivia question that Kristen will take away. Hi there, I'm Kristen Gapsky. I'm the director of the Entrepreneurship Center and thank you, Erin, for being here and for doing so much work on this event. And we're very appreciative to our great faculty artists who will be here presenting. So I know you wanna to get to that. Um, but first we wanted to have a little art for thought for a moment. Um, don't put anything in the chat yet, but what we're going to ask you is what you think this Banksy piece of art went for. How much did this sell for? Uh, this was in 2018. Don't look it up. Don't Google. Uh, just, just think through and imagine what you think this may have sold for. This was a piece of art that was partially shredded and then I believe got shredded immediately after it was sold. Um, so I'm going to count to three. And then as you're thinking about it right now, think about your numbers. After I count to three, throw your numbers in the chat and we want to see if anybody gets near the selling price. And you may know because, oops, there's one. All right. One, two, three. Go, put your numbers in. What do you think? Wow, big range. These are great answers. Yeah. We had $4 up to how many million? million? 20 Let's million. See. We have 60K, 2,500, $4. Yeah. <laughs> That's million. how it is with pricing art, right? Yeah. <laughs> there, there's the challenge right there. Okay, 3,000. 5,000, 2 million, 1.5. All right, uh, I see a few more coming in, 6.5 million. All right, so I'm ready to reveal. I'll watch the last couple come in here, 2 million. All right, this sold for $1.4 million. So there you go. That was just a little trivia to get you started. Um, Jill, did you have anything to add about that piece? New. So it, this piece was just recently in the news. Um, it's titled Love is in the Bin. And it was resold again at an auction this October. And so this, you know, you mentioned that it was $1.4 million. This year in October, it sold for $25.4 million. And the entire piece is not completely shredded. It's only halfway shredded. Um, and I, you know, I did a little research on this and Banksy said that the shredder had actually malfunctioned and it stopped shredding. Um, it was supposed to shred all the way through. So that's just the extra information that I have. Thank you. So because it was only partially shredded, there's more value, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Okay, so we will talk very briefly in a minute about the Entrepreneurship Center, but first we wanted to show you some information about our presenters. Um, we have Valerie Mann, who will be first. She's a local painter, of course, instructor here at WCC and a gallery owner. And we have lots more information on her there. And we will be sharing this with you as we 
uh, or as Aaron mentioned in a follow-up email. So you'll get this whole PDF and you'll be able to read this information about our artists. Terry Abrams teaches here as well at WCC and is a photographer. And Jill Jepson is also a faculty member and is a, an artist and a letter pr letterpress printer. So we have a lot of um, mixed media here uh, and that'll be well represented. So you'll get this information. And of course you wanna hear from them. So I'll be very brief about the Entrepreneurship Center. But we wanted to welcome you to this event. Uh, thank you for coming. We will send a recording link as well. We have lots of other archived um, webinars and especially we had a three-part series last March and April um, on the business of being an artist. And they're, they're just packed. We had wonderful panels of artists, three different events, and that's all archived on our website. Um, but we are here, we're located at WCC on campus, and we're here for students or community. And we're here to support you in your business or entrepreneurial endeavors, no matter where you're at, if you're just beginning, if you're deep into it. Um, and we serve as a resource hub and a connector to resources, mentors, programs, materials, tools, things you might need. So in terms of uh, our basic services, we do the one-on-ones with you if you fill out a basic business assistance request form that's located on our website. We'll meet with you one-on-one -on -one in person or virtual. Um, most people are doing virtual, but we have some in-person appointments at WCC. And then we can talk from there. Uh, we have a newsletter that goes out almost weekly with lots of information about events, grant opportunities, artist supports, um, and lots of different industries. And on the bottom left there, we do have free market research help. Um, this is useful for discovering your competition, your target market, um, figuring out the kind of research you may need to know to market properly um, and sell your artwork. And then of course we have our Entrepreneurs in Residence program. We have nine local entrepreneurs who we contract with to offer free appointments to all of you. And one of them is under our Business of Being an Artist program and that's Sandra Zanakis. And she's a local jewelry maker and a coach for artists. So I think we have a slide on her coming up in a minute. Um, and that's again, part of our business of being an artist program. Um, as you, if some of you are going toward the art show, which we'll explain more about the WCC art show that's coming up, we might be able to help with some information on that. Um, and here's the information on Sandra, our entrepreneur in residence. So we've got a lot of supports for any entrepreneur in any field, but specifically a lot for artists. So please know that. And these are the ways you can connect with us. The orange and blue are all linkable here. Um, our main phone, our main email address, and then how to sign up for our newsletter or do that business assistance request form. So thank you for listening to that. Uh, we're happy to partner with the HSBS division and these wonderful faculty to present this workshop. Okay, so first is Valerie Mann. I'll hand it over to you, Valerie. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I had to unmute myself. Um, so uh, I, I wanna start by saying sometimes on windy days, my internet is a little tricky. So I apologize right now if, some, if I freeze up or you guys freeze up, I'm not sure which end it's on, but um, anyway, I'm here right now. Um, so uh, welcome. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, pricing your artwork. Um, you know, there, it's one of the biggest questions artists have when they come to our gallery or, you know, when I have students that ask. Um, and it's difficult because, you know, we're always emotionally connected to that thing we just made. Um, but we also want to, um, you know, we also are not starting a personal collection of our own work. I mean, some people like to hold on their, onto their stuff, but I know years ago I had a student who was hesitant. She was, I coached her through high school and she was hesitant to sell a piece. And I said, listen, I said, I had these really, this portfolio of really great figure drawings from college I thought were really great, right? And I, people had wanted to buy some in the past. And, oh, I just didn't, you know, price them. And then my basement flooded and that's where the portfolio was. So they were all the way gone. I would have rather had a little bit of money than having to throw them out. So, um, so that said, I think um, one of the ways to think about pricing is when you're, when you're making work and you're ready to sell it, it's always good to go look at uh, places like locally, you can look at the Ann Arbor Art Center or come to our gallery, WSG Gallery, or um, any other you know, art center, center or gallery and look at other artists work who make things similar to you, um, similar price-wise, uh, size-wise, 
sorry, not price wise, size wise, materials, um, and uh, and for instance, you know, if you're a figurative painter, you're probably not going to price it like an abstract painter. So look at uh, work that's in a similar vein to you. Um, and, you know, as much as you can take the emotion out of it. Um, I know people that price things by the square inch. Um, and sometimes that works. Sometimes it, it doesn't, you know, when you, when you look at your different sizes, sometimes it doesn't make sense to go that way if, for us to price a, a large work, the same method you'd use to price a smaller work. Um, um, you know, I also feel like um, it's really easy to underprice your work. And if you're pricing someplace that charges a commission, you need to make sure that what you, you know, for instance, normal retail is 50%. So if you're selling at a retail location that takes 50% of your sale, you need to make sure that whatever you price it for, you're gonna be happy with what you get. Um, and, uh, you know, my opinion too is underpricing stuff doesn't really help it sell better. Um, it, people are either going to buy something or they're not. Um, if, if someone like someone, you know, wants to buy a piece of yours and you know that um, they're tight on cash, you could say, hey, let's do take do a layaway. You can I, I can take payment over time. And that way, if they really want a piece of yours, they are happy to sort of take their time. You can you know, store it in your studio till they're ready to pay it off. And I've, I've bought artwork that way too. And I, I'm happy to buy it. People are happy to sell it. Um, uh, let's see, I have down here experimenting with pricing from show to show. I do that sometimes because you know, I'll price something um, maybe a little lower than it should have been. And if it didn't sell, then I have an opportunity the next show to maybe raise it. Sometimes I fuss around with my prices a little. For instance, if I haven't, sold something, but I pulled, sold something very similar and I sold it for um, a price that I felt like I should have charged a little bit more. Maybe I'll raise it a little bit. Um, people might ask why you priced your work the way you did. Um, one of my answers is, well, I, I've sold work similar to that at the same price. And so it's sometimes sort of what the market will bear. Um, but uh, also, um, Oh, I had a really great thought there. I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> let's go. Let's go over to the basic factors. Maybe it'll come back. Um, so the basic factors are, um, uh, you know, think of your cost of materials. You're not always going to recoup. Uh oh, where did that slide go? Okay. Sorry. You're not always going to recoup um, the. Uh, well, let me put it this way. You know, if you're if you're casting a bronze piece and selling that, you're going to have to recoup your materials and your and your labor. But that's you know the the materials are going to be um, uh, and a, a factor in your pricing. Um, if you're casting bronze versus a drawing on paper, obviously those are different materials are different. Um, but, uh, a piece on paper sometimes is cheaper than a piece on canvas. Not always. Right. So, um, again, sort of looking at comparing your work to other work in galleries and, and uh, is a good way to, to start out. Um, if you have to pay for, you know, space, um, or tool rental that needs to be factored in um, level of craftsmanship if you're a beginner rather than an established artist. Um, it, not always, like sometimes there are people who have just picked up the brush but had a you know studied studied art um, and have just picked up the brush in a long time and they're and they're making work that's great. So again, sort of study work that's similar to yours. If it's produced under instruction, for instance, a project in a class, generally that work isn't allowed to be entered into professional shows like juried shows. And generally that's going to be chart. You're going to charge less for that kind of work. Not always, but if, if definitely if it's a project um, and it, which means it wasn't sort of your original concept. Um, um, let's see, ready for the next slide. Um, and I've talked about this a little bit already, sort of when I say research your market, that's go to the galleries, look at the other work, go to art fairs, um, go to art sales, um, like the, the West Side Art Hop or different things like that. Um, you know, uh, one of the key things on here is, are you selling to people who are already collecting? Are you selling to your peers? Um, are you selling to a relative? I, I would always, my, my warning on that is, <laughs> Um, be careful when you're giving work to, you know, maybe if it's a relative or a friend, if it's someone who you, you know, you really have a great relationship with and you really um, uh, want this person to have it, that's, that's, that's great. But beware of uh, 
beware of discounts, right? Because if you set that, um, if you set that precedent up, then you're setting up some sort of an expectation for next time. If it's someone who's bought work of yours already, I have what I call a friends and family discount because I have family members who buy my work, you know, who don't expect it as a gift. And so that is, um, that's somebody I want to, you know, reward, like you believe in me, you want to support me. I, I appreciate that. Um, let's see this, this last part on this slide, timing and consistency are important. Um, don't wait till just before the show to price your work. That's really important because you want to have a little time to think about that. You don't want to sort of do it out of desperation um, because you, what you price something, you might wake up, wake up the next day and say, I wish I'd priced that for more. Um, uh, and I, I have here keep pr prices consistent across all venues. And, and what that means is, right, I have work in my gallery and I have work at some other shops that charge a higher um, commission. I want to keep that that price consistent so that I'm, first of all, happy about what I get from the place with higher commission, but also, um, you know, don't say, oh, well, you can buy it cheaper at this place. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of um, a snotty thing to do to places that are supporting you, whether it's your gallery or another business that's carrying your work. OK, I'm ready for the next uh, slide. And then I know I know my time's coming up. I know um, so so a lot of this information is gonna it's gonna all be in the recording. Um, so this is kind of a repeat, right? To visit the galleries, also to decide which ones you want to have uh, sell your work. Do they make you feel welcome? Uh, are they gonna give other people that same feeling when they walk in? And and I like to work with places that feel welcoming. Um, are they knowledge about the, uh, knowledgeable about the artists whose work they represent? Um, I think that's important for them to take it upon themselves to know a little bit about you and your history. Um, if you're taking work to a place, uh, don't expect them to look at it on the spot. Ask what their procedure is. Maybe call ahead and say, hey, I'd like to show you some of my work. Ask for their email. Send them a link. You know, um, just communicate uh, well. <clears throat> Always ask what kind of consignment arrangement they have and ask to see their contract to see if it sounds something uh, like, like a place you want to work with. You don't have to give your work away or your your soul in in um, the the form of your work. Um, we're all grateful to sell work, but um, but you're you know you're putting yourself out there as a professional and keep that in mind. Um, make sure you get a copy of the contract, and if there isn't one, write up one of your own. You can find examples on the internet, or you can make something sort of simple just so you both understand what the expectations are. Um, time frames in the agreement commissions and any fees if they have any insurance you know I've worked with a lot of places that have no insurance probably most of the places I've worked with have no insurance and I've been lucky um that's unfortunately there's sort of not a great insurance tool for um for places that sell artwork um unless it's a really giant gallery like I would imagine Petter Galleries over by Saga Talk probably has a uh, good insurance because it's a huge gallery but um uh it, it's tricky um so next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. OK, great. So um, again, there's a lot of information here, and I won't get all through, through all mine before. It's not my turn anymore. <laughs> but um, uh, I have this piece up here, this uh, little drawing of mine um, that I put up that um, I just wanted to give you sort of example about how um, you know, what, what I priced this, I sold this little drawing for $350 and I think it was maybe nine by 12 or a little bit larger. Um, you know, I was, I love the drawing. I would have been just as happy to keep it, but, uh, so I probably could have priced it for a little more and sold it eventually. But, um, uh, I was also happy. The person who bought it was thrilled. So, um, so I was really happy about that. Um, let's see, next slide, please. Um, so again, a, a lot of this information has to do with sort of just being a good human, right? Having integrity and transparency when dealing with your customers, gallery owners. Um, on the slide before, I didn't read, I didn't say this, but you can of course read it that make sure you write thank you notes to the people who buy your work. Um, uh, I think that personal touch is really, um, help, helpful. Um, um, if you, one of the important things here on being a professional is if someone wants to, wants to commission you to do a piece and it's not in your wheelhouse, um, 
most of us know a lot of other artists, like connect them with another artist that would be better at handling that project and, and give them all the information so they can get in touch with them. And then also give the artist the person's information if they'll give it to you. Um, I always think that's always good karma and it comes back around in a good way. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, so this gives some different options of exhibiting your work, although we're talking mostly about setting prices, but go through and look on, on this information. And I'm happy to answer questions after this if anybody wants to contact me through the Entrepreneurship Center. This watercolor on the right it was actually on a full-size piece of watercolor paper, so it was 30 by 22 inches. And um, I priced this one at $1,000. And um, just as a little you know, store anecdote here, the people who bought it I had it on my Etsy shop and the person who bought it um, sent me a message one week and said, Hey, we, I, I'm really interested in buying this for my wife. What's the best you can do on the price. And I do free shipping when I do stuff on Etsy. And I thought, you know, that's, that's the best I can do. And it, to me at the time, I was like, I don't, I don't really care that much if I sell this or not. I'm not selling it for less than what I, what I need out of it. So I priced it at a thousand. I said to him, you know, it's, it's the best I can do on the price. And there's, there is free shipping. And the next week he ordered it and bought it. So it was a, you know, a little happy story of sort of standing my ground, which has taken me a long time to, you know, to learn to just be like, yep, that's, that's what it's worth. So um, next slide, please. Um, and this one uh, was a painting that a, a lovely fam family member bought, you know, and um you know, I find that posting my finished work, even processes, process, process, work in process pictures on Instagram and Facebook are, are great um, ways to get people interested. You know, a lot of our friends and family want to support us, um, but, you know, then they don't always live in the same area or um, uh, or come to where you're showing your work. So um, this happened to be my cousin. And he said, we really want that piece. And so, I, you know, I was thrilled to... Um, to sell this and that price reflects what I sold it for. Um, I don't know if there's another slide after this, Erin. Oh yeah, this one um, too. So um, this one, I pri this price is way too low for it. And again, this was on a large sheet of, uh, full size sheet of watercolor paper, 22 by 30. And I did end up selling this unframed for a thousand dollars. So, um, you know, I probably could have charge more, but I was happy for to get that. And the person who bought it was thrilled and ended up actually buying two watercolors of that same size, each for a thousand. So um, uh, next slide, please. Oh, this just shows that little one again. And um, let's see, I don't know if there's one after this, Erin. Oh yeah, so this shows a couple other pieces that, um, that I've sold just so you get the, you know, an idea of price and size. Um, the one on the left is a wire uh, study of a figure. I did this sort of wire drawing, I call it. And um, I sold it for 200, but I've sold work since then for two, about the same size for 250. So I think in the future, I'll price all that at 250. And then the one on the right is a, is a wall hung sculpture um, that I priced at, at 500 and sold. And so the, that seems to be sort of a, a good spot for that size of piece and that um, type of wall sculpture. Um, I think that's my last slide, maybe, Erin. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Valerie. Oops, there it goes. Okay, so next we're gonna have Terry Abrams talking about photography. So are you ready, Terry? Oops, you're muted, Terry. Thank you. I was just saying I'm in awe after Valerie's presentation. <clears throat> I am too, thank you. Uh, so so I'd, I'd like to, so I'm a photographer uh, and what I sell are photographic prints. Uh, so, so from the camera, um, I do, uh, I adjust the images in software. Uh, these three images, you know, are quite different from what came out of the camera. <clears throat> because I'm interested in color, uh, line, abstraction, and so forth. 
And then uh, I print my images on um, the highest quality watercolor papers that are designed for photography. I do all the printing myself. I have a wide format printer that I use for printing and as, as well as doing the matting and framing myself. So, so for me, that, that hands-on connection with the work is, is very important. Um, and I have to figure out how to charge for that. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, but before selling anything, what Valerie already mentioned this, you know, market research is so important because it's not just what the market um, is, is selling for, but it's where do you want to be in the market? You know, you'll find that work sells for a wide range of prices. If you walk around the Art, Ann Arbor Art, Art Fair, you see that. But it's like, where, where do you want to be within that range? Do you want to be at the lower end, maybe higher volume? Or do you want to be at the upper end, uh, lower volume, somewhere in the middle? You know, so that's something to research. Um, Another thing is, is I don't skimp on quality. I'm, I'm putting out, you know, the highest quality they can, they can find. And uh, so, so I'm very confident in my pricing that they're receiving very good value for what they pay. Um, some of the things I hire out because I want to spend more time on creative work. So for instance, if I'm doing an art fair and I have to prepare 50 mats um, you know, I don't stand around and cut those myself. I'll have, I'll have that done outside and uh, that extra time I can use for my creative efforts. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Sorry about that. Everybody. Oh, thank you. So, you know, as a photographer, um, there's, a, there's a high investment in equipment. Uh, in the digital age, equipment gets updated on a regular basis. Uh, and so, I, so if I calculate every expense that I have, it's actually quite high. And my, uh, my business, you know, is not a charity. <laughs> I like to think of it as a for-profit business. And so, um, so I have to calculate, you know, my expenses into my pricing. Uh, so, you know, there's equipment, there's the, the papers that I use, things like office supplies. For me, that's travel expenses because I, I might need to go to uh, uh, the glacier in Iceland or Uzbekistan or spend some time in Italy, you know? So all those travel expenses, uh, hotels, meals, etc. Not to mention my education and training conferences and seminars that I go to, networking expenses, my website, phone, insurance. So there are a lot of expenses. And, and obviously, I, I don't put that cost into one print, but I factor, I add up those expenses and I realize that, that you know, at, at the end of the year or at the end of two years, I'm going to incur all of these expenses and that the money that I earn needs to exceed my expenses and hopefully exceeded enough that it contributes to my income. All right, next slide. So these are some examples of pricing. Um, I like to have, if I'm at an art fair, I like to have something inexpensive that, that people can buy. Someone loves my work, they go, oh, I'd really like to have that. You know, and so then there's something at the $50 level that, that most people looking at art can, can usually afford. Uh, but as you can see, as the size of the piece increases, um, the cost of manufacturing, it, uh, the cost of producing it goes up, and then the, the cost of the piece goes up. And one, one thing I do is I raise my prices on a regular basis because so far my expenses haven't gotten less expensive every year. Um, they're usually more expensive. And it also increases the value of the work if my clients see it rising. Okay. So, um, you know, engaging your audience means exploring the world of art fairs. Um, art fair is a great way to get your work out there, have people see it. It's, it helps you organize your work. It helps you present it in a professional way. And you're going before a jury. If, you know, like at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, you're going before a jury. So, so you, if you get selected for the art fair, then you're among those who've been juried into the show. 
um, giving presentations about your work. Again, um, you can contact groups, libraries, you know, they love to hear from artists, um, embrace the opportunities to exhibit it, um, vol- do some volunteer work that might involve the work that you do. Um, but that's easy to get sucked into. So try to limit um, the amount of work you do that, that distracts you from producing your artwork. And uh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for that great information. And with that, I will transition it to Jill. You're ready, Jill? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about printmaking and specifically letterpress printing. I do have some background in printmaking, but lately I've been focusing on letterpress printing. And one of the things that's kind of come to be is that printmaking used to be an original form of communication. And now it is really valued as an artistic medium in its own right. So to make a print, and Terry's talked a little bit about his prints and that he's actually involved in the printing process himself. Um, With this, this is all hands-on where the artist typically creates an image on a flat surface. The surface is then inked and then it's pressed onto the paper to create an original print. So you can see that, especially on um, my far right image here, that is my little Vander Cook uh, proofing press. And you can see I did a silhouette of Michigan um, and I have to hand ink that and I have to lay the paper down just so, and then I crank it through the press. But one of the beautiful things about prints and printmaking is that this allows for multiple um, images and they can be reasonably priced for many people to purchase. Okay, so so that is really, really nice. Um, It's a way of getting an increased distribution of your work out to the masses. So Terry mentioned that he's keeping up on technology with his photography uh, equipment and I'm going back in time. So I am going back in time where it's hard to find my equipment, but you can see that it takes up a lot of space. Uh, The image on the left is my Chandler Price electric printing machine. Um, It's run on, it's the only press that I have that runs on electricity, but because it's an electric press, I can hand feed about 200 sheets of paper through in an hour, but I can only print one color at a time. Okay, so so that's kind of that that is kind of the downfall of this. Um, It's interesting, the big press that I use, it literally weighs one ton, so I really need the space. Um, and I can't move my equipment around. I cannot travel uh, to do my work. Rather, I have to be in my print shop. So the big piece, I do mostly cards, small posters, um, and other small items. And then the smaller proofing press on the far right there is actually um, where I do my larger posters. But again, I am limited to size constraints based on what my printing presses can manage and what they can tolerate with sizes. So yes, I can really only print one color at a time. Um, And so if there's three colors in a print, uh, it's going to become more expensive. And I'll I'll talk about pricing in just a few minutes. Can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, I'm just gonna mention one thing, but you can keep it at this slide. Um, I was in an art fair a couple of years ago. I, I will get to art fairs and art markets and things like that, but My common question in an art fair is, was that printed on a computer printer? And I'm like, no. So I I ended up learning that I have to educate my market as well. Um, And part of that is, is them understanding the process. And so sometimes I'll bring in demo pieces. Sometimes I'll bring in images of my press so that they understand the labor and um, the technical skills needed to actually do this type of printing. So what is my bread and butter? So bread and butter work are items that are fairly easy to make and they generate consistent and reliable sales. Okay, so this does not need to be your main focus. This may not be what you are most passionate about uh, in your creative research, but it will res- But this type of imagery will resonate to a wide range of buyers. 
So back in 2015, which was six years ago, I, along with everybody else, started to play with the Michigan silhouette, okay? And I was pretty much on the early side of the trend of this. But what I discovered is that I was making quite a bit of money by selling these handmade prints at the beginning, but then eventually it started to taper off. And so you have to understand that for your bread and butter, if you're in the middle of a trend and you have the ability to create multiples, it's great for business. But what I learned from this is this is not always going to be my bread and butter, okay? I constantly have to reinvent myself. Um, I have to constantly be doing creative research and trying new things and know that doing that type of work will lead me into finding my next bread and butter item. I have a friend that does jewelry. She did a whole jewelry line and she thought it was going to be the next, the next best thing and ended up very few people bought it. So you, you don't really know what the market is going to tell you. So you have to kind of play with that in order to um, kind of come up with that really solid bread and butter item. So a couple tips for finding what that bread and butter item is, is really thinking about your experimenting. Um, it's when you kind of go out of your comfort zone and you start play and you start to experiment with new ideas um, and new processes. That's usually when it's something, um, an aha moment or something happy, a happy accident happens. Create something bold where the artwork has a really strong use of color and texture and something that catches the eye. That is really what's going to catch that potential customer's um, attention. And to work in series. And I've not really done this yet, but I, I'm kind of starting this in my own creative research of collage is if you have a large series of work where maybe sometimes you have a hundred different pieces and they're all similar, but they have maybe different colors included. Um, that usually generates a lot of sales because you have multiples of them and they're usually reasonably priced. And next slide, please. So I, I plugged this in this time. This is a new slide compared to last year. I think what's really important, you know, we talk about pricing our work, but I think another side, another component to this is finding a sense of community. So you find a sense of community with your potential customers, but you also find a sense of community with the people that support you in your business. Um, so I want, I'm kind of putting it out there is to think about what you're passionate about and what you can share with your community, creating work that inspires you and it, um, you can share it with your potential customers. So for me, I did this, not this past summer, but the summer before, um, I did a giveaway for my business. I don't even think I have my, I probably should have had my business information on it, but I literally put these in seven different parks, one park each week, and I printed over 200 posters and they were free. And people, I would just put it on social media. Hey, there's posters. Please put this in your window um, to support inclusive, um, inclusive community um, outreach. And so that was one of the approaches that I took um, is kind of giving back to the community. You can also give back to a community organization when you sell your work. You could sell it and you give a certain percentage to a community organization that might lead to a lot of sales, especially if your potential customers um, are interested in that community organization. And you could also donate your work to an organization's fundraiser or silent auction. That's a great way to market your work um, and get some attention as well. So not to say that you need to do this all the time, but for me, especially during these times of protest and social justice, I kind of find how can I do this? How can I use my business and my product and actually go out. It's kind of me sharing how can I contribute to what's happening in the world by giving back to the community. So when in my breakout room today, I'm gonna to talk about another artist. Um, we'll look at her work. And um, she also does this as well, where she gives out her images for free. Next slide. So Terry kind of mentioned about the art fair market um, and 
I have never done the four to five day Ann Arbor Art Fair. I've participated in smaller scale art fairs um, on the west side of the state. And selling your work to a wide range or like a large amount of people within a short time frame is a great way to get exposure quickly. But as Terry said, there are a few things that you want to think about. You first of all also want to find art fairs where you have support. You have places to stay and help during the fair. These are just logistical things, but you do, you need breaks, okay, as the artist in this booth. And so I would go to the west side of the state because I have family over there. They helped me set up my tent. If I needed to take a break, they could cover my booth. Um, and it gave me a comfortable place to stay. I wasn't looking for a hotel like everybody else was. You may wanna visit the art fair before you apply to be in the art fair. Um, and do some research. How many artists are selling work that is similar to yours? Um, what's the price point? And what type of customers are visiting the booth? At the West Side Art Fair that I was in, the Coast Guard Art Fair, I was a pretty high-end print product because I'm doing this by hand. But there were people that were um, doing other things that maybe they were relying on manufacturing to produce them. So they were a lower price point. So you want to make sure that you're kind of paying attention that you do fit into that price point. Um, otherwise, you may, you may get very little sales. So another thing that I noticed in doing this, because I was such a newbie in doing an art fair, is I started to do research on who was stopping by my booth and who was actually talking and purchasing my items. And this helps me understand like what type of clients are interested in my work, especially when I was doing a lot of the Michigan silhouette. Um, but going forward, you can use your research and experience as an art fair as really indicators where you should end up marketing your work. So no matter where you're selling your work, it's important for you to share your story and your creative process with your audience and your potential customers. This is an opportunity for you to build a connection with a potential buyer, and they may come back to you because you have shared that story. And that story is actually a story that they can share when it is hanging in their home, um, and it creates a conversation as well for them among um, their community of people. And really, everybody loves a good story. <laughs> 